Well, welcome, Res Life family, as we uh, look into the second week of the uh, book of Colossians. Even though Colossians is a pretty short book, it's only four chapters long, we're going to break this thing down uh, week after week. I don't know how many weeks we're going to go here, but uh, it's one of those ones as you kind of dive into it, like I told you last week, uh, and maybe you're joining us for the first time. Maybe you didn't see last week's message uh, as we started the book of Colossians. I encourage you to go back, listen to it, watch it. But uh, I've never really done a book study or teaching on a book study. I've taught out of the book, so I've been teaching and, and trying to preach the, the gospel and, and the, the, the Bible for years. But as far as actually like diving into a specific book and then trying to break it down, not necessarily verse by verse, but uh, just sections at a time. And, and how does that apply to us today? And so we, here we are, second week of studying the book of Colossians. And... Um, I don't like I said, I don't know how many weeks we're gonna go here, but we're gonna try and break it down and see how it applies to our life today because I feel that in many ways we are in a, a very similar time um, as, uh, as, as as it was in the Bible when Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul was writing to this small town, this this uh, city uh, called Colossae. and um, we're going to give you some of those things today. We're going to relate those things, and you'll maybe be able to see where we're at. But uh, let me pray real quick before we get into this thing, because I get excited and I get caught up in details. My wife teases me sometimes, and other people as well. I don't always mean to say my wife, but uh, several people uh, have told me that I'm the king of useless knowledge. I get caught up in, in minor details that a lot of people might not really matter and I get I get uh, <laughs> just kind of down in the nitty-gritty and it really doesn't matter to the bigger picture but I just get caught up in a small minute de details kind of like when I was in college and I was studying art I would get caught up in, in the brush strokes and in and, and how the framework was done and stuff like that and it really took away it's a part of the bigger picture but I get caught up on those little things so let me pray Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to uh, be in a country Lord, where we can uh, broadcast this publicly over the airways and we can dive into the, your word, that we can uh, preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we can proclaim your goodness, and we, oh God, can, uh, can, can uh, continue to uh, lead and guide and, and to actually equip people. Uh, to become more like Christ and to be the hands and feet of Jesus here on the earth. Father, we thank you for what we're doing. Not what we're doing, we thank you for what you're doing and what we will do from that. God, we give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. I, was, uh, I, I came into the office uh, the other day and someone had left me a list of some things. and Not, a, like, not like a to-do list, but just uh, some different things. And on there, there was a, there was a, I don't know if you want to call it a quote or a saying or whatever. And I, I just thought it was pretty funny. And uh, it was this, it said, and I th kind of think this about 2020. And it said this, it said, this too shall pass. It may pass like a kidney stone, but it will pass. And man, uh, 2020, if, if, uh, if, it pass, if it's passing, it is passing like a kidney stone. It's painful. It's chaotic and knowing what's going to come next, we don't know, but we know the truth is, is that God can use us and God can work in, in all things. Uh, last week, as I came to you, like I said earlier, we started a little bit about uh, Colossians and it was Paul. And I spent a lot of time talking about Paul and what why he was writing. I'm going to just recap some of those things. I get excited about this part personally because Paul was such a... Uh, a dramatic figure. Uh, many people have referred to him as one of the most influential people in the spread of Christianity next to Christ. I mean, what he did, you know, uh, they, they attribute, you know, depending on what viewpoints you take and what you study about, about 13 books of the New Testament, uh, 27 books in, in, the, in the New Testament, he writes or is attributed with writing uh, like 13 of them. I mean, a major, major influence in what was happening. And uh, Paul, uh, as many of you know, his name was Saul, and he was he was a Hebrew of, a he, of the Hebrews by his own recognition. I want to read a uh, passage of scripture to you out of Galatians, and this is this is Paul 
giving his uh, kind of account of who he was as Saul. Like many of us, we, we have nicknames in the past that maybe we've earned and uh, things that have lived on about us. But this is what Paul says about himself in, in Galatians chapter 1, verse 13. He says, you know what I was like when I followed the Jewish religion, how I violently persecuted God's church. I did my best to destroy it. Now, that's the New Living Translation, and I want you to remember some things. We've got to remember this about Paul, because Paul is now on the other side of that, the one who was once violently trying to destroy the church or the way of what Jesus had come to do, because he was a Jewish uh, a, a leader. He was a Pharisee. His whole life had been trained in, 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 in following the commands and the law of God. Remember, the New Testament hadn't been written. What, we're, what many of us preach and live off today is the New Testament. It's what we know of the Bible and of history after Christ. But this is Paul, and he had spent his whole life studying Old Testament books and the law and the commands and what you're supposed to do and how you're supposed to do these things. And, and here comes Jesus, a man that says, that says uh, you know, uh, this is a new commandment I give to you, right? That, that you love God and, and you love and you love your neighbor as yourself, right? And we think about that. He says it's all summed up into these two things. And even though it's similar to, to what he had been studying in the Old Testament, it's completely different. He's, he's saying, look, that's the old way. This is the new way. And for someone that has been stuck in traditions and and uh, ways of men, it's hard for them to understand when something new comes along. Many of us today probably still struggle with that. There's probably some of you that are watching this today that would still prefer to handwrite a check and put it in an offering plate instead of using new technology and using an app to send money virtually. Some of you may prefer to talk face to face instead of texting a, uh, a friend or a neighbor. See, we, we kind of have those old ways, those old traditions, those things that we like and those things that we're, we're stuck in. I, I think about this, you know, my dad, he, would used to, he used to tell me how he would do things when he worked construction. And when I got into the construction industry a few decades later, you know, technologies had changed. Things had gotten different. And I, I was tell, trying to show him some of the things that we were doing, still getting to the same result at the end, but it was a new way of looking at things. And I couldn't understand his way sometimes, and he couldn't understand my way sometimes. That's what Paul is doing here. Paul, Paul was being confronted with the, these things, this, this gospel of Jesus Christ and who he is and what he came to do. And he, uh, in, in Acts, and I think it's in, in, verse, uh, in chapter 8, it says that, that he was one of the main proponents who completely agreed with the stoning of Stephen, the very first martyr for Christianity. Right, the one who was trying to, to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ after he was crucified. Just a couple of years, maybe, maybe within three years, Stephen uh, was stoned to death for preaching this gospel. And Paul, who was then Saul, was so adamant about, don't you dare mess with this uh, religion, this Jewish customs that we have, these, these, uh, the, these commandments that we've been living by for hundreds and hundreds of years. How dare you? come in and try to get people to go a different way. I'm sure many of you can kind of relate to some things. Maybe it's not religion, but maybe it's, maybe it's some traditions. Maybe it's some things, not even, not even talking about sinful things or religious things, but maybe you have a certain way that you like to do holiday meals, but then a new tradition comes along and you struggle with that because it's completely different than what you've done before. Or maybe... It's a vacation spot where you've always went, but now as your kids or grandkids are coming up, they want to do something different. We, we all have these different things, or maybe, uh, maybe you're kind of a brand person. You always have driven a Ford, but now your kids are wanting to drive a Chevy or a GMC or a Tesla or who knows what. And, and it goes against the grain of who you are. It's like, we've been this, this, and this forever, Right? That's what Paul is dealing with, not just on the religion side of it, but as a Jewish man, as a man who had been brought up and as a Pharisee. I want you to think about this. I read this in preparation of this, didn't know this before. 
But they say that a Pharisee, especially uh, one of the, the, the top Jewish thinkers, as Paul is often referred to, he was, he was so far up there, and he was one of the leading men that he was, in today's terminology, he would, it'd be like having a double doctorate uh, in, in academics, in, in college. You know, thinking about that, you know, the kind of the uh, respect or whatever that we might show someone that, that we know has, has went to school or went to college for years and earned a double doctorate or a double bachelor's. You understand what I'm saying? That, that they, had, they had dedicated their life to something. And now all of a sudden, someone comes in and begins to say, no, there's a different way. This is something completely brand new and you're trying to wrap your mind around that. That's what's happening here. And we, I, I, I gotta be careful because I get so caught up in, the, in this transformation of Paul. You know, it's not like he had to go back to school for years and learn a new major. Literally, within just a couple of days, with an instant of coming into contact with the power of God through the Holy Spirit, that Paul or Saul is transformed into Paul to where it says that he immediately begins to go and preach the other way against everything that he had ever learned, everything that he had ever known, everything that he had ever stood for. He is now completely doing just the opposite. That truthfully, what Paul is doing now by his own standards just a few days ago, he could have killed himself because he's doing what he was persecuting. I mean, grab a hold of that. And that's, what we're, well, that's what's happening. But, but here's what's, what's so cool about this book of Colossians. Uh, this city, Colossae, is actually made up in a region of, they say, maybe three other cities. Laodicea, uh, Heropolis, and Colossae. There were, all, there were three of them. And Colossae was actually the small town. It was, it was a suburb of, say, Decatur or a suburb of of uh, Chicago or Atlanta or uh, Detroit, whatever big city you want to think about, right? Uh, and, and so Heropolis was a, was a place, I want to say maybe like Hawaii or, or uh, uh, Florida. It was a, a place of health, recreation, enjoyment, relaxation. That's what it was known for. And then you come to Laodicea, which was a, this huge commercial area full of politics. And we know that that things were going on, but actually, according to some of the studies, it actually says that Colossae, the small town, was possibly the most wicked. Not like small towns that we think about here. Now, in our culture, what we think about is, man, you want to get away from the big city because it's crazy, it's out of control, and the crime rates, we need to get down into to small town living and come back to this way of just family and traditions and all those things. But what happened here is Colossae was going the other way, and Paul hears about it from a man named Epaphras, sorry, Epaphras, while he's in prison. And he hears Epaphras is actually this, uh, this man who had heard of the, the, the teachings and the preachings of Paul, and his life has changed, and he's going out and beginning to spread the gospel. And Epaphras, who in this, in this book of Colossians actually says, who one of your own, Paul refers to him as one of your own, right? Uh, has come to me and told me these things. And so in the beginning of Colossians, this, this first couple uh, verses in chapter one, he's talking about it, saying, hey, we're giving you thanksgiving and we're praying for you often. We've heard these wonderful things about you. And what we need to understand is Paul is also, you know, the reason that he oftentimes he's referred to as the apostle Paul is he had, he had well over a dozen churches that he had founded and started in in today's culture, what we think of is we think of these church buildings. Uh, that's the church that he started. But oftentimes in the New Testament, it was literally getting people together in a home or in a, in a, in a central location and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and the church would become alive. Think about in Acts where, where um, Peter comes out and, he, and he, he talks to everyone after the upper room experience. And it says, and many were added to the church that day, right? And, and then later on in Acts, it says, and the Lord added to the, to the house or to the church daily, such as should be saved. It wasn't to the building. It was the church as the body of believers, those who are following after Christ, the head of who we are. And that's why Paul is writing uh, this, this book of Colossians. Uh, they, scholars actually kind of divide the book into two different uh, sections. The first two chapters is, is actually dealing with who Christ is because what ha was happening in Colossae is it was a blend of all these different 
uh, areas. And so there was paganism that was coming in, all these different beliefs. And some were, were believing that Jesus was uh, a God incarnate, the body of Christ or the body of God, right? Living among them. And, and others like, no, he was just a good teacher. Yeah, he did some miracles. And so there's this idea that Jesus Christ wasn't really um, the supreme being of, uh, of God Almighty, that, that there was some some uh, discrepancy about who he was and w did he really die for all of our sins? How could he die for all of our sins? And trying to grab a hold of that, this new way, this new te teaching. And so some of the, remember they're in the, in the, in the Roman uh, rule here. And so they worship false gods and Greek mythology and all these things were floating around through these small towns. And so Paul is writing on behalf of Epaphras what he hears and he says, look, I'm concerned because Epaphras has come back and he's sharing great things about, about Jesus and what he's done. And, and there's some great work that's happening, but we're beginning to mix everything together. Man, it kind of sounds like today, doesn't it? You can be a Christian, right? You, you, can, you can cuss, you can drink, you can sleep with whoever you want. You can vote Democrat, Republican, blah, 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 whatever you want to. But I believe in Jesus and it's all good, right? It's this blending. There's no, Jesus in the New Testament, is, it says that we're called to be separate, that we're, we're to be, uh, um, we're, we're called out from among them, right? There's something that's supposed to be different. And Jesus refers to us as the salt of the earth. Salt it's something that brings out flavor, brings out the fullness of what's there. And it's, it's made to be separate. It's not meant to blend in. It's meant, it's meant to be different. And we got all these different things. And that's what Paul, one of the things that Paul's coming against is this idea of people not really believing that Jesus is who he said he was and that he really was God incarnate. And so we look at these different things and, 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 as we get into this thing, there's this danger of falling back into the gross um, uh, immortality that often came with um, uh, Greek mytholo uh, uh, mythology and paganism and all these different things and the many different things that they would do. And actually, they had a, a, a saying and it was called the Col uh, uh, Colossian her uh, heresy, Colossian heresy. And it broke it down into four different things. And I, I didn't know this until I started studying this. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to relate it to you and see if some of these things don't line up and apply with some of the stuff that's happening right here in our own country, in our own world today. There were four different elements that, that made up this, this title or this saying of Colossian heresy. And it was the philosophies of men that they would pull teachings from, from all these other teachers and whatever kind of lined up with where they were at, that, that Jesus was just among them, that he was one of the good teachers. He was one of the, the influential people. We look at where we're at in our world today and basketball uh, players and uh, movie stars and politicians and all these different people have these followings uh, of people that believe in them and are pulling out truths and living by some of the things that they, that they say are true. And we look at these things and, and, and Paul addresses that in, in these first couple of uh, verses of Colossians chapter one. I think it's around verse eight, he begins to address that and he's talking about that, that Jesus is all sufficient. He is supreme. Everything that he has needed, everything that is needed is in him. And uh, in Colossians, I think it's Colossians chapter two, verse eight, it says, um, uh, don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ, right? And he's talking about the, the fullness of the Godhead dwelt bodily in Jesus Christ. And he's trying to come with that, against that, because that was one of the things that was messing with this new church of Colossae is this idea that Jesus wasn't really the fullness of God. He was just a blessed man or he was a blessed person. The second thing was Judaistic ceremonialism. And, and what that had to do with is exactly what time does a man get circumcised? And are you really a follower of Christ if you're not circumcised? And if I don't fast a certain time or a certain excuse me, or a certain way, or if I eat this type of food or drink this type of drink, 
do those things make me unclean or am I unworthy? And it was all about what are you doing personally? It, it got into this thing and, and how to observe certain days and holidays. And it was all this man's idea of trying to appease God and make yourself right. And so it, it got into this works mentality. And he's, he's writing against that because these were part of that Colossian hearsay or heresy. And then they got into angel worship. They're worshiping spiritual beings. And, and many times today we hear of people talking about uh, when you pass away from earth and you're going you're gonna to get your, your, uh, your wings, your angelic wings. An angel is an angel and a human being is a human being. That's my personal opinion. I can't really back that up right now, but that's just what I believe. Uh, you know, in, in the Bible, it talks about angels coming down and, 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 and having conversations with us here on, on earth and this idea that when someone goes to heaven, that now they become an angel, they become this person that we can worship up there in heaven. No, that's the same thing that happened with Satan, with Lucifer. He drew attention away from God and got them to worship him instead of worshiping God. It is God Almighty that we worship. I don't know about you, I love, I love the fact that my dad is in heaven, but here's, here's what bothers me. I don't want to think about my dad watching me. No, you've lived your life with me. Worship God, the one that you were, the one that you sought for all your life, right? And so that's what was happening is they were getting all these different things and they were beginning to get twisted. And then the, the last one was this kind of this harsh, um, uh, this harsh treatment. We find this happening today, this harsh treatment to try and control the lust of our body things that they would do to get themselves to not eat unclean things, locking themselves away and cutting themselves and, and, and wrapping themselves up and cutting things off and all this crazy stuff, almost kind of like body mutilation to try and control the, the body to make it worthy uh, of being a Christian. And all those things were blending together at the time when, uh, when Epiphras tells Paul while he's in prison, in a Romanian prison, Say, man, there's some awesome stuff happening back at, at my hometown, but this is what I'm worried about. So Paul and Timothy write this letter, and uh, it, 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 Paul mentions Timothy, and this is what Paul is trying to address. And he knows that, look, in Galatians, this is 20-some years at, when, when he writes, did I read that? I think I read that. And in Galatians, it says, do you know what I was like? Right, that was 20-some years after Jesus had died. And Paul is still tell, telling people, you know what I was like. Remember what I was like. And I think sometimes we run into that. I've, I've shared this, this with you a few times. That when, when I run into people that I went to high school with or college with or maybe that I grew up with in different, uh, different phases of my life before I gave my life to Christ, we kind of catch up on some history and, and, I'll, and a lot of times it comes up, hey man, what are you doing now? And I'll tell people at the time, I used to tell them as a youth pastor, now I tell them I'm a pastor, and just kind of this dumbfounded look would come upon their face and they're like, what? No, I remember you, man. There's no way you could be a pastor. There's no way you can be a youth pastor. And, and some of you have those same experiences. You know, you think that you were a pretty good person or maybe you were that person that was kind of like me that you lived a completely radically opposite lifestyle than a Christian and trying to realize that today your life is changed and transformed through the power and the love of God Almighty that it blows people's minds. But here he's coming back to him and he's writing to him and he's saying, look, I've got some people that are telling me they're from your own hometown. I'm not just this person that's, that, that's out of state and out of mind. I may, may not have personally met you, but here's my story. This is, this is who I am. And he begins to write to them. He's not trying to, 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 um, Get, get new pen pals to write back to him while he's in prison. No, he is worried about the, the um, consistency, about the, um, uh, the performance, I guess, if you, uh, lack of a better word, you know, the consistency of what is going to happen to the church if I die here in prison. There has to be some solid truth. I got to make sure that things are established correctly so that it can continue to grow for years and decades and, and, and centuries later like we have it today. That's what Paul is writing about, and that's where we're at today, Christians. We're at a place where we're going to have to stand up for the Word of God, and we're going to have to correct some things in ourselves 
and also in others. But here's what's so, I, I love the way Paul did this. And we're, the main part that we're focusing on today is Colossians chapter 15 down through about uh, 20, somewhere in there. And it's, it, it, this is what it says. Christ is the, vi now I'm reading out the New Living Translation. I'm sorry. Um, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He's God in the flesh, right? And he existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. Remember, Paul's trying to address these things. Look, he's not saying, look, you dummies. I told you about this once. Can't you? Right? He's coming at it with love. He's coming at it with his personal experience. This is who God is. And, for, uh, um, and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things that we can't see, such as thrones and kingdoms, rulers and authorities, and the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is the body. See, he's trying to establish him. Who is Christ? He's the head of the body. He's not just a part of it. He's not just some, some person. It's not like, oh, he was a good person and we need to follow him for a while until another good person comes up and then we'll follow him. No, he is the head of the body. He is the beginning supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. For God is in, in, for God in all his fullness was pleased to live through Christ. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself, and he made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by the means of Christ's blood on the cross. See, he, he talks to him in those first, you know, one to ten chapters, nine chapters, whatever, or verses, I'm sorry, Colossians chapter one. He talks to him and he's telling him, look, these are the great things I've heard about you. You know, I'm praying for you. I'm believing that God's going to open your understanding, that God's going to reveal his truth to you. That's kind of what we dealt with last week. That he's saying, look, you need to understand all of what God is, not just a tiny portion of who he is, but you need to, you need to, to believe in all of them. That's what I asked you last week. Are you praying for those other Christians? Are you praying for your friends that go to other churches or live in different states or in different countries? Are you praying and asking God to reveal all truth and all wisdom to them so that they can truly know the, the fullness, the completeness, the supremacy, the awesomeness of who God is? Are you praying that way for your people? Or are you just praying, God, don't let them fall into sin today? Or are you praying, God, just bless them, give them more money, give them more houses, give them more? How are we praying? Are we, this is Paul. Paul in prison, right? In prison, being beaten, being, beaten, being, being persecuted for being a Christian. Remember, he's in the same Roman Empire that crucified Christ. He's, he's probably got kind of a little bit of, of insight or foreknowledge of, man, this is probably what's going to happen to me if I keep pushing. But it was so important for him to make sure that the church that goes beyond him is established. And I think about that in, in, in our own lives today. Do we, are we pouring things into our friends and to our families? Are we pouring them into our kids and the generations that are coming up after us? Are we making sure that they're rooted and grounded in the truth and the understanding of who God is? Or are we just trusting a society to raise them? Or are we just trusting that, well, if I, if I live a good life and, and I keep them protected in my home, that they're gonna live a good life and they're gonna know God, that they're gonna know better? Do we kind of believe those things? And for me personally, I kind of relate things uh, that are biblical or scriptural and I relate them to my own personal life. Where am I at? And I know I use my kids a lot, uh, but the, uh, that's where I'm at. Those are my kids. And so uh, my son has been doing some, some training, some athletic training, some physical training with, with weights and stuff like that. And uh, I've been doing push-ups and sit-ups and stuff like that with my dad since I was probably five years old. It's just how we grew up. And uh, dad taught me some things and then I got into high school and they taught me some things and I got into college and they taught me a, a few things that are a little bit different than what dad taught me and then what, what high school taught me. And then, then I, I became a, a level one a CrossFit instructor and I learned some things from there that didn't, I didn't learn from before. And I did a little bit of bodybuilding when I was in my late teen, early late teens early 20s and I learned some things there and I did some nutrition stuff and now all of a sudden 
I've got a son who's 14 years old that's coming up, and there's some coaches and stuff that are telling him how to do this and that, and I'm looking at it with all of my experience and all of my years and saying, well, there's some truth to that, but you know what? This is, can you see how that relates? This is what Paul is facing in the church, and that's what we're facing in the church today. Many teens today believe that, that as long as I just believe in God, that I can do all these other things, and eternity is set for me, and I don't have to live my life a, a specific way, a, a, a called out way, a, 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 a consecrated way. I can just have a, a belief system in, in who God is and who Jesus was, and I can accept all the great things of, of Jesus and what he did for me, but I don't have to change my life. And that's what Paul is trying to come to these guys. And he's trying to come to them in love and in encouragement and, and trying to build them up. And he's trying to, to, to help them go on. And that's where we're at today as we continue digging into these things and digging into the book of Colossians as Christians in a modern day world. What are we facing? What things are, are we, do we find ourselves fighting for? What things do we find ourselves saying, no, this is the truth. This cannot change. It has to be this way. And what things are we are we kind of being uh, loosey-goosey about, right? And we're just, well, whatever, that works, however you want to do it, that's fine. You know, there's some things in the Bible that, that are true, that have to remain the same. Jesus is the Son of God, right, who came, he died, he lived a perfect life, and, and his life was the sacrifice and payment for our sins, and that believing in him, that we can be saved, that, we, that our life can be transformed and changed just as Paul's was. But we have to begin to follow in those footsteps and begin to change. See, Paul, once he had the encounter with, with God, and, 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 and then it says that, that he was blind, he had to go, and Ananias came, and all these different things, go back and read it in, in, in Acts, I think it's around 7, Five, somewhere in there, I can't remember exactly where it's at, read through there, and then you'll see that after that transformation, it says that immediately Paul got up and went the exact opposite way of everything that he had been doing because he realized the errors of his way. See, you can't accept truth and then not change what's not truth in your life and be walking in it. So I want to just encourage you today uh, as we, we kind of dove in there for a little bit and finding out what, who, who is Christ and how does he redeem us back to himself and, and realizing that, it, that it's the, the forgiveness of sins that Christ came and died for. And yes, we don't have to live guilty of all those things, but we can be transformed, that we can live a life that's worthy of the calling. And we're going to keep going on through these, uh, through these verses in this, in, this, uh, in, in this book of Colossians, four chapters long. It's not long at all, but we're going to break this up in the next couple of weeks, section by section, and find out what was Paul trying to do through this letter and find out, can we also take some things from the book of Colossians and use that to help our friends, help our loved ones, help our neighbors, help our coworkers, so that the kingdom of God can advance beyond this place and that it can be something that, that's, that, that is remarkable. It doesn't have to be... Uh, uh, a, a negative thing that doesn't have to constantly be a war, even though there will be some, some fighting and some, uh, some, some persecution that we have to face, but God can be glorified in all those things. I pray that today that you'd be blessed. I pray that you'd be encouraged by the words of Paul. And I pray that the, the truth of the scripture today would be rooted and grounded in your heart and that it would produce much fruit, just as Paul asked and prayed for the, the, the Christians in Colossae, that you too would produce much fruit as God reveals himself to you. God bless you. Have a great day.